Hey everyone, welcome to the February Azure Infrastructure Update. So this is going to be something new that I'm going to update basically every month. And the goal is really around providing information about what's new around Azure infrastructure. So think networking, storage, compute, identity, security. The goal is monthly. If I find there's too many updates coming, maybe I'll do it every two weeks. Kind of will experiment, see how this works. But really I've had a lot of people coming to me saying, how do I stay up to date? How do I see what's new? So I'm gonna try and do this just little short monthly update. My really goal is this should be less than 15 minutes. Um, I may do kind of like an email thing as well. I'd really love your feedback. Um, the details about some of the features I'll talk about will be in the notes for this video. And please subscribe. Um, go and subscribe and you'll get an alert when I put out one of these new monthly updates. And please, please provide feedback in the comments. This is kind of the goal to share information. So I'd love your feedback. And I think each month what I'll kind of do, I've got these little challenge coins created. I used to do them for my master classes. Um, kind of the top comment for the month, I'll send one of these kind of on board to Azure challenge coins. So let's kind of get to the features. So Azure Security Center um, had a call update. I can now export my reports to CSV. So these are just kind of the regular reports I would have in Azure Security Center and also for my security alerts. Now the great thing about this is, is that it's actually leveraging the Azure Resource Graph. And what that means is I can actually export this information across multiple subscriptions. So I get this great way to see my security reports, my alerts, not just for one sub, if I have multiple subscriptions, I can kind of see across all of them. Next, Azure Site Recovery. And what we now have is, we always have this kind of encryption at rest. And one of the very popular options is a customer managed key for our storage. So I control the key. Now, if I have managed disks that are using a customer managed key, I can protect them with Azure Site Recovery. Additionally, if I'm protecting on-premises, for example, virtual machines, I can now replicate those into a managed disk that uses a customer managed key as well. So cool capabilities. Azure Backup now has support for Windows Server 2008 when it's running in Azure. So hey, I've used Azure Site Recovery, for example, to move from on-premises to Azure. Now I can actually protect it when it's in Azure. If I have a lot of information, I want to move to Azure Backup, now I can do it offline. So rather than having to populate the backup vault over the network, what I can actually do is I can use Azure Databox. So this is like an appliance that would be shipped to my data center. I would copy the data on and then ship the appliance back to have that hydrated into my backup vault. Or I can use Azure Databox disk, individual disks. Again, I copy the data onto them, ship them to the Azure Data Center, and they'll hydrate that into my backup vault. So now I can do an offline population of my backup vault. And now soft delete for SQL Server and SAP HANA that's running in Azure Virtual Machines. So soft delete means, hey, I've gone ahead, I've deleted this thing. Rather than it being gone, for 14 days, I could actually go and get that data back. And there's no cost to me for that. I'm not paying for that 14 days. So previously this existed for Azure VMs, but now it'll actually understand, for example, my SQL Server backups. So if someone maliciously went and deleted uh, my data, deleted my backup, well, it's actually still gonna be retrievable for up to 14 days. We now have Azure Backup Explorer. So this is a nice little interface that lets me quickly kind of see the state of my overall backup health across different vaults, different subscriptions, and even different tenants. Networking. We now have the Azure NAT Gateway in preview. If you think about Azure NAT Gateway just super quick, if I think ordinarily, for example, if I have some kind of virtual machine, well, we have the idea of, for example, an instance level public IP address, which is 
directly associated with a virtual machine for inbound flow of data, a service I want to make available. Or I could have a public IP on maybe some kind of load balancer and one of the targets is my virtual machine. And in the past, our outbound access to the internet might also leverage these things. But now with kind of this NAT gateway, this is primarily focused on, hey, I want to go out to the internet and the response will come back. Likewise for this, this was about getting services into the virtual machine and I could send the response back. So it will understand it would still work with these services, but now on the NAT gateway, I can give it specific IP addresses or IP prefixes. So I'll know the IP address these requests are coming from, if I maybe wanted to whitelist it for other sites it's trying to access. So it's now this dedicated, very resilient, specific service, this NAT gateway, that I can use in conjunction. So an instance level public IP or a load balancer, I'm still gonna use those when I want to make services available to the internet. But for my requests out to the internet that I want to go and get things from, I can now have this dedicated service. So that's now in preview. NSG flow logs can now be configured via ARM templates. So I can actually have that built in as part of my deployment. And service endpoint policies went GA. These are a very cool technology. If I think about, hey, I have a certain subnet that is part of some VNet. So I've got a, a greater VNet that this subnet is part of. Now ordinarily, I can use things like network security groups. I can put a network security group kind of around a subnet and I can use service tags to control which services from that subnet I can reach out to. So I might say, hey, um, yes, I'm allowed to go ahead and access Azure storage, and maybe even Azure storage in a certain region. So I can control what services I can use. And then if I think about, I actually have that service. So let's say this is storage, what I can do is this has its own kind of firewall as well. And one of the technologies I can do is a service endpoint. So I can give this subnet a service endpoint. Then on the firewall configuration of that target service, I can say, well, look, only the service endpoint for this subnet is allowed to talk to me. So I'm controlling this subnet can only talk to storage, and this storage account can only be spoken to from this subnet. But there's nothing to stop me if I was a bad resource in this subnet, creating another storage account, and then from here, connecting to that storage account, and then copying the data somewhere else, so data exfiltration. So what storage endpoint policy does is on the endpoint that's allowing me access to storage, I can say, hey look, the policy is gonna let me only talk to this particular instance of Azure Storage. So now from this subnet, I can't get to any instance of Azure Storage, for example, that is not part of the policy. So it really kind of completes that whole picture. So that has now gone GA. Azure Private Link, this has gone GA. This is the ability for PaaS services, like Azure Storage, um, Azure SQL Database, to inject an IP address into a subnet, and then I can access that service via that IP address. You can almost, this can be used in a way instead of storage endpoint policies, sorry, service endpoint policies, um, to only allow me to access certain instances. I can also publish my own services out to other virtual networks using Azure Private Link. And I have a separate video where I explain what Private Link is. So the overall service has now gone GA, but then it's down for individual types of PaaS to then support Azure Private Link. So Azure Key Vault um, is now in preview for Azure Private Link. Azure DNS Private Zones. This is now GA for government and Azure China. This is that capability to host my own zone. My private name is not internet available. 
And what we can do is I can make that zone, for example, if I think about creating just a DNS zone here. So I've created my private zone and then I have multiple virtual networks. So what I can do is when I have my virtual networks, I can say, hey, I want you to maybe go and register with that DNS zone. I also want you to be able to resolve from it. This one maybe just resolves, but doesn't register records. And I might have other private DNS zones. This is like another private DNS zone that this could also resolve from. But I can only register to one. So that's what the private DNS, it lets me host DNS zones in Azure for private usage, but I can use them for multiple virtual networks. A single virtual network can register, so it can register to only one, but like it's going to register its records, but it can link to multiple zones for resolution. And a single zone can have lots of virtual networks, both registering records and resolving records. So that capability is now GA for government and Azure China. Azure Firewall now has the ICSA, Labs Corporate Firewall Certification. It now has forced tunneling support. So if I wanted to, I could take all of the traffic that's coming to Azure Firewall and actually send it down maybe to on-premises. I can now create IP groups. I can take IP addresses, put them in an IP group, and then create rules around the IP group, not each individual IP. And Azure Firewall Manager is going to preview. This lets me manage groups of Azure Firewalls. I can have different levels of policies I can create to help with my configuration. And it supports both Azure Firewall deployed in kind of my own virtual network or using kind of Azure Virtual WAN. For virtual machines, the A8 and the A11 series retirement has been advertised. I think you've got like a year, but after that, you need to migrate to something else. And so think about that now. Most logically, these were the high performance compute original SKUs that that RDMA networking. So you're probably going to migrate to the H series virtual machines. When we think about the H series, we now have the new HPV2. This is actually based on the AMD Epic processor. These are memory bandwidth optimized. There are other ones that are more um, compute optimized. So there's different types of H series, those high performance compute available. There are the new DAV4 and EAV4 SKUs. And again, these use the AMD EPIC processor. So the DA is more general purpose. The EA SKUs will then memory optimized. On the storage side, Azure Shared Disks is now in preview. This lets me have multiple virtual machines connect to a single premium or ultra managed disk. And AD authentication for Azure Files is now in preview. This lets me have Azure file shares and actually use Kerberos for the authentication from my regular Active Directory. So now I can do ACLs just like I would with a regular on-premises file share. Both very cool features, both have videos created that go into detail on those. So with that, that was the kind of quick, that's kind of my goal is to just introduce at the end of each month what was released in that previous month. So please, if this is useful, uh, subscribe, give me a like, and please comment, I want the feedback. Um, you'll get the alert when I release a new one. Uh, I'll also tweet on NTFAQ guy, but keep those comments coming, and I'll uh, see you next month. Thank you.